Dear all, this is the sixth out of the seven audio recaps that have been done as summary of the International Business Law Lectures by Dr. Mark Wakami at the European Law School Bachelor's Course at the Maastricht University. This is a summary of the sixth lecture of the course. It is meant to be a brief overview, which does not replace the attendance to the lectures or the tutorials, the reading of the course reader and of the recommended literature therein. Please mind also that for your memorandum, as you did for your mock arbitration strategy, you are required to cite all relevant articles, which for the sake of time are not always mentioned in this recording. The sixth lecture focused first on payment of goods and second on ethics and business perspectives. As for the first, we saw there are several payment mechanisms. The most used payment mechanisms are demand guarantees, bills of exchange, and letters of credit. In the demand guarantees, the bank becomes a guarantor. And in the bills of exchange, a party declares in written that they owe a specific amount to another. There are several types of letter of credit, but for the purpose of our course, we refer to the usual type. That is to say, a document that assures that the beneficiary, usually the seller, will be paid upon the presentation of documents to the bank. Letters of credit are regulated by a set of private rules enacted by the International Chamber of Commerce the UCP 600. The way letters of credit work is well described in the numbered scheme that you will find in the lecture's PowerPoint slides. In a nutshell, we have first the sales agreement between buyer and seller and the agreement by the same parties of a letter of credit as a means of payment. The buyer also called applicant here, contacts the issuing bank requesting it to open a letter of credit. This bank will contact another bank called the confirming bank here and assure they will pay in place of the buyer. The conforming bank in its turn notifies the seller that a letter of credit has been opened and that the document seemed to be valid after which the seller sends the goods to the carrier. The carrier sends the bill of lading or consignment note to the seller. From this point on, we have a chain of subsequent reimbursements in this process. The seller sends the documents to the confirming bank that pays the seller. The confirming bank sends the documents to the issuing bank that pays the confirming bank. Finally, the issuing bank sends the documents to the buyer that pays the issuing bank. Last but not least, the buyer sends the documents to the carrier that delivers the goods to the buyer. Of course, there would be much less transaction costs if we could find a way of having huge businesses blindly trusting millions of their hardly earned euros or dollars to totally unknown and distant based businesses, but then they would probably be like The duty of the bank to pay is in principle not affected by whatever happens with the underlying contract. This is, by the way, what the autonomy principle in Article 4 of the UCP 600 is about. As Article 5 very clearly states it, banks deal with documents and not with goods. The banks have the duty of examining the documents according to Article 14. If the documents are not okay, then according to Article 16, banks must refuse to honor the payment or ask the applicant for a waiver. But well, as with every principle, there's always an exception. In this case, the exception is fraud. There can be a fraud in the underlying contract, 
the seller defrauds or attempts to defraud the buyer, but there can also be fraud in the letter of credit. The seller attempts to defraud or defrauds the bank. If a fraud can be proved, then the applicant may file an injunction for the bank to refrain from making payment. In this case, the bank will circumvent Article 4. After having talked about means of payment and letter of credit more specifically, the second part of the lecture was aimed at discussing business perspectives, namely 1. Risk and Cost-Benefit Analysis 2. Reputation and Corporate Social Responsibility and 3. Profits very shortly on these three aspects. As for the first, you will see, if you pursue a career as an international business lawyer, that both risks and benefits come from both external sources, for example, regulations and competition, and also from internal sources, for example, processes and people. A robust risk-benefit analysis takes both these sources into account and is very important to an effective management and sustainable business growth. The reputation mechanism is one of the main causes of the current attention of companies to corporate social responsibility. Indeed, the reason why companies care about corporate social responsibility is because they know they need to have the society's validation. For that purpose, firms must keep up to the stakeholders' expectations in terms of planet, people, and profit. A company with environmental and employee-friendly policies builds good reputation, but it is profits what companies really care about. money is in everything, but for startup company founders, and it's most likely that a few of you will become that, it is a top priority. Now, say you are a company that wants to save the world. If you sing this, sorry. If you tell this to investors, they will moot you and ask for your profit margin. Now, I know some of you are familiar with the documentary series available in Netflix that is called Rotten. The final episode into the dives of challenges facing America's top dollar fishing port of New Bedford. It pays special attention to fishing magnate Carlos Rafael and his corrupt practices on the docks. They actually call him the Cod's father. It appears that he's originally Portuguese. We, we say in Portugal, há, uma e, há mil e uma maneiras de cozinhar bacalhau. There are 1,001 ways of cooking cod. And it seems that there are also 1,001 ways of not paying for it. This documentary series shows that for the sake of money, there are environmental protected species which are being harvested, as well as hundreds of fishermen that are watching their way of life disappearing. This is a good example where planet and people are being totally overlooked for the sake of profit. Another thing Mark told us in the lecture was about ethics, and he pointed out that the arbitration rules and International Bar Association, international principles on conduct for the legal profession. These principles, which you may find in the folder, talk among others about the duties of independence, impartiality, and competence. Having been born in the 90s, I guess, there's a chance you're not familiar with The Cosby Show. This was an American television sitcom starring Bill Cosby, 
which aired on NBC from 1984 until 1992. The show focused on the Uxtable family, an upper-middle-class African-American family living in Brooklyn. It was TV's biggest hint, hit in the 1980s, and Bill Cosby, Cliff Uxtable in the series, was named as the greatest television dad. Oh, we're talking about a car now. I knew something was wrong when we went down there and the man saw that she brought her father. So the man said, well, I don't think I can find the keys for the car. So I said, well, I don't think I can find the money. So the man found the keys. So we get into the car. Now, first of all, to be honest, this is a beautiful, beautiful looking car. I mean, if Denise is sitting in this car, her friends are going to say, look out. Denise, or chilly down, or cool back, or whatever these people say. On October 2014, a comedy routine by comedian Hannibal Burris, alluding to Cosby's covert sexual misbehavior, went viral. And since then, the comedian has been accused by numerous women of rape, drug facilitated sexual assault, sexual battery, child sexual abuse, and sexual misconduct with the first incidents taking place as back as from mid-60s on. Now, just three days ago, it appears that Bill Cosby's attorneys have filled a motion calling on the presiding judge, Stephen O'Neill, to recuse himself from the sexual assault case, citing a conflict of interest linked to his wife, Deborah O'Neill, as she's a well-known advocate of victims of sexual assault. With less than two weeks left before the retrial, Cosby's attorneys filled a memo questioning Stephen O'Neill's partiality in the case. If you were you, and although this is not a business case, how would you decide? Would you say the impartiality of the judge is compromised? I leave you with this bit of food for thought before the next and the last recap of next week. Good work and see you then.